wonderful. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I can tell it's the masters because you're all clapping like someone made a putt. It's kind of nice. <laughs> and, um, but we are, we're going to uh, take a look at a story that uh, God dropped on me today and, or, or this week for today. And I want to share with you a, a moment. Uh, it's actually a moment after a moment <laughs> that Jesus had. Jesus took three of his disciples and he went to uh, up a mountain. Uh, it's a mountain that we call the Mount of Transfiguration. It, it's where Jesus had this incredible experience. And, and if you want to read about it, that's actually at the beginning of Mark chapter 9. Uh, but after this incredible experience, Jesus came down from the mountain and he had an interesting moment. A very interesting moment. It's a moment that I want to challenge all of us to place ourselves in here today. Because Jesus did, not only did he do a miracle, but I believe that he changed a lot of lives on that day. And how many of you know, every time we come to God's house, no matter who we are, and no matter what our experience is spiritually, God intends to change us. Amen? He wants to make us closer to him. And so today, I want to invite you to stand with me in honor of God's word. We're going to read this together, if you're able to. Uh, Mark chapter 9. And if you're not able to, then you know, don't, don't push it. Um, but we're going to start in verse 14. I'll get my eyes on here. There we go. Are you there? Can you say amen? amen. Now, if you don't have your scriptures with you, uh, you can look on the screen, and uh, we've got everything you'll need here today. So here we go. When they came to the other disciples, this is now Jesus coming down from the mountain with his crew, all right? When they came down uh, to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. And as soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and they ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. And a man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son, who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of his speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth. He gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him, and when the disciples saw Je- oh, I'm sorry, when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you could do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. And immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit. He said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And the spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up to his feet and he stood up. And after Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? And he replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. In some translations say prayer and fasting. So let's pray. Lord, I believe that you have a desire to meet with us in some way, shape, or form today. So Lord, we ask you to do that. So have your way in this place. Touch every life. Touch every heart that's hearing this today. And Lord, we'll thank you for all that's done in Jesus' name. And we all said amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Now, let me pause here and suggest to you that I am not here to cast demons out of all of you, okay? I am not a... I, some of you, you know, maybe. But, uh, but I am not a demon under every rock kind of preacher, okay? So if you sneeze, you do not have a spirit of colds. You know what you have? You have allergies. That's what you have, okay? 
Goodness, there's just some tricked out weird theology out there that blames a demon for everything. Remember Flip Wilson? How many of you are old enough to remember Flip Wilson? Yeah, remember one of his key phrases? Remember that? What did he say? The devil made me do it. Yeah, 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 not so much. Uh, but uh, so, uh, so I'm not going to go there, okay? But here's what I want to do today. Uh, I find that when Jesus came down from this mountain, he uh, interacted with a number of groups of people. There were a number of groups of people that Jesus encountered at the foot of the mountain. And it just so happens that I believe that we may be able to place many, if not all of us, in one of these groups. You see, it wasn't just a demon-possessed boy that Jesus dealt with. Not at all. Jesus dealt with quite a few groups of people here today. and that, so, so there's a lot here, okay? Does that mean you're going to preach long? I never preach long. <laughs> well, some of you believe that. That's cool. All right. That's great. That's great. But I, I am going to try to uh, be sensitive to your time. Uh, so l- let me identify these groups here today, and, and you may fit into at least one, if not more, of these groups of people. First of all, when Jesus comes down from the mountain, the first group that he encounters is what I call a mad multitude. He comes down, and, and wow, doesn't this happen a lot, by the way? You have this glorious experience with God, and you come down from your spiritual mountain, and what do you face? <laughs> you got people in your life that are arguing and fighting and, and causing all kinds of trouble. Uh, that, that's, that's par for the course. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. But Jesus comes down, and look what he discovers. Take a look again at verses 14 through 16. It says, when they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them. And the teachers of the law, what were they doing? Were they worshiping? Were they studying the Bible together? What were they doing? Arguing. They were arguing with them. But as soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder. And they ran to greet him. And what are you arguing with them about, he asked. Now, This is interesting to me because in the midst of having this great moment with his father, Jesus comes down from this mountain and he discovers that there are a group of people who are arguing and fighting and and, and they're, they're just going at each other. And can I tell you that that is not God's best for his followers? That's not God's desire. I'm not one. If you think after some of you who've been here the whole time, after 20 years, you've probably learned I don't major in minors in this thing, in this place. I don't. If you want to argue because the chairs are green instead of purple, uh, fine. But, but, you know, I honestly... I don't care. Uh, You know, I I just, it's not, it doesn't mean, and purple would be a little much, but, but it doesn't mean anything as far as eternity goes. Not at all. I don't get caught up in things that do not have an eternal significance. And what I have found oftentimes, that a great way that the enemy will try to attack a body of believers is to put in a little seed of uh, arguing and divisiveness. How many of you know that the devil doesn't care how large a church gets, but he does care how united a church gets? And God can do more with a small united church than he can with a divided big church. And so the enemy will often try to attack from within. Now I have, in fact, that's usually his main area of attack. The worst diseases you could ever think of, and and some of you are thinking of things like cancer or or, or diabetes, or, or, or those attack from the inside of our body, correct? For the most part. They, 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 they infect us from the inside, and then they have an, an, an impact on the rest of us. That's how the enemy will try to infect a body of believers. He will 
try to infect from the inside. And he will try to use divisiveness. May I tell you, there is a difference between disagreement and division. There is a difference between disagreement and division. We can disagree on things. Like, there's a lot of Browns fans in here. Right? And there's a lot... (laughs) And then there, there's these lost people that love the Pittsburgh Steelers, right? You need Jesus. And then there's the Dallas Cowboy fans who will have that special place at the right hand of the Father when they go to heaven. You know who you are. We can, we can disagree on stuff like that. Does that have any eternal significance whatsoever? No. No, not at all. Not at all. We could even disagree on how ministry gets done sometimes. Well, we used to do it this way back in the 1950s. Why don't we have a cassette ministry anymore, pastor? Because there ain't no more cassettes. Somewhere we got a cassette duplicator in this building. I'm not even sure where it is. But I think now we could send it to the Smithsonian and we can make some serious money by our, our submission there. How many of you know sometimes methods change, but the message of the gospel never does? Amen. And so sometimes we get caught up in different things. And, and, and what happens? What happens? We make some of these things hills to die on. Things that really have no eternal significance whatsoever. You know what hill I will die on? I will die on something that impacts someone's eternity. That's the hill that I will die on. But if you want to argue about whether the pastor wears a tie or not, or, or, or whether my son's hair is too long, or, or what, and, and your hair is wonderful, son. But, uh, and some of you are just jealous because you ain't got that head of hair. But yeah, I know. And some of you ladies too. And, and, uh, we're just, we're, we're just not going to get caught up in that. We don't get caught up in that here. Because there's more important things to get worried about here. There is a city of Akron and Canton and Cleveland and the surrounding area that needs Jesus. And that's what we need to get caught up in. So we cannot be distracted by arguing and divisiveness. And I love how Jesus came down from the mountain and he didn't pick a side and start to engage. He said, what are you arguing about? And I think that's Jesus' message to the church. What are you arguing about? Okay, you voted for him. You voted for him. Let's just reach Jesus or, or reach out to Jesus and reach this world for Christ. Arguing and divisiveness are contrary to the presence of Jesus. Did you hear what stopped the arguing? Did you see what stopped the arguing? They were overwhelmed with, literally with the presence of Jesus. If you're more overwhelmed by getting into a big old fight or argument or causing trouble, and we really don't have a lot of that here at all, if any, but if, if that is you, in the name of Jesus, get yourself right with Jesus. Get yourself right with him because that, I'll just say it right now, Anything that divides the body of Christ is demonic. I should have got a better amen on that. We dare not divide the body of Christ. We need to get more overwhelmed with the presence of Jesus than the presence of controversies and arguments. Can I, can I say, I love this church. One reason why I've been able to stick around for 20 years plus now is because you haven't worn me down and beat me up with minutia that doesn't matter. So I thank you, church. I wish, honestly, when I hear stories from other pastors, and you've heard me say this, but you got to understand, I mean it, I start bragging about you all. Because I'm like, you should meet my church. Because they are wonderful. So we gotta we gotta work hard to keep that unity. Can you say amen? Yeah. All right, I gotta I gotta keep going. But if you find yourself kind of get caught up in this, can I give you a prayer point today? Can I give you a way for you to pray this this morning when we're done? I'll call this the mad multitude prayer. 
Okay? Look at this. Maybe you need to pray this prayer. Lord, forgive me. And seriously, if you're, if you're about segmenting and dividing the body of Christ, then you need to pray for forgiveness. You need to pray for forgiveness because that is a sin. So Lord, forgive me. Help me to move from a place of arguing and division to peace and unity. Can you say amen? So maybe that's the prayer that you need to pray here today. We'll show that prayer later on in the message. Number two, Jesus came across not only a mad multitude, but he also found a fractured family. He found a fractured family. Now, pastor, where do you get this? Well, this is, uh, this is kind of interesting. Because starting in verse 17, Jesus comes across a father who has a concern. It says, A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of his speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. I'm going to keep this scripture up here because I want to show you something. Okay? If I'm the dad and I go to Jesus, I say, Jesus, my, my boy, I brought you my boy. What's wrong with your boy? Here's my first complaint. He, he gets thrown to the ground. Sometimes he's thrown into the fire. He convulses, he seizes, he gnashes his teeth. I mean, I can't take him anywhere. He's great at parties. Um, but that wasn't, that wasn't the dad's first complaint. What was the first complaint? <laughs> I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of his speech. Jesus, my son and I don't talk anymore. You see, when members of a family stop talking, the enemy is at work. When members of a family stop talking, the devil is pleased. May I tell you that God instituted the family before he even instituted the church? And one is not at the expense of the other, by the way. Not in the New Testament. Not now. But having said that, the family is an incredible priority. Incredible priority in the eyes of Jesus. And it was amazing to me that the first thing that the father mentioned, my son doesn't talk to me. Even in the church, folks, man, I, I, I have met, I, I, I won't drop names, but I, I have met so-called experts in family counseling and family living, giving advice to other people on how they should have a healthy family who are so, they are estranged from their own children. They won't even talk. Who's at work there? The enemies at work there. But it's not just father, son, or mother, daughter. Maybe it's two spouses. Maybe it's two siblings. Students, maybe it's you and your sister or you and your brother. Maybe it's uh, adults. Maybe it's you and your sister or you and your brother. But may I tell you that the enemy, I believe firmly, is waging an out and out assault on the family. He is attacking the family. In fact, in our culture, the enemy is trying to redefine the family. 
the enemy is trying to warp what the Bible says a family is. And we can't allow that to happen. If we're serious about this Jesus thing, then, then we need to understand that the enemy is going to try to attack our family. He's going to try to attack my relationship with my wife. He's going to try to uh, attack your relationship with your spouse. Do you realize that the divorce, th- there, is a, there is a pull to divorce right now since this pandemic started. Divorces are on the rise. <laughs> Well, we're staying home together all the time. I don't know if that's a connection. But divorces are on the rise. Young people wanting to take their own lives has skyrocketed. The enemy is trying to kill, steal, and destroy. But that need not happen. Because Jesus said this, you bring that boy to me. You bring that family member to me. How do we do that? Do we pick them up and literally take them to church? Well, okay, but but maybe, maybe we could just go to God in prayer and say, Lord, touch my boy. Lord, touch my daughter. God, touch my dad. Lord, touch my mom. Touch my brother or my sister. God, God, I refuse to, because here's what's going on. Well, that person's just hard to get along with. You've got to see the big picture. It's not just them. The enemy is at work. And the enemy loves this. So what's the prayer of the fractured family? If you find yourself in that situation, what's the prayer? Here it is. The fractured family prayer is this. Lord, restore my family. And may love and forgiveness dominate our relationship. And that means that maybe some of us need to seek forgiveness. Some of us might have to say, I'm sorry. And I know that's hard. But it can be the most liberating thing you do for your family. Some of you need to grant forgiveness. Oh, sure, I accept your apology, but I'm going to get you. That's not forgiveness. We forgive as Jesus forgave us. Amen? And if you have a family member that is just so... Look, I get it. They don't want to talk to you. I I have that situation in my family. Not here in Ohio. Okay, you're all like scowling at Jonathan, you jerk. No, it's not him. We're quite close. Uh, But I've got a situation where I have a family member that wants nothing to do with me. So what do I do with that? Uh, Jesus told his disciples when he sent them out on a missions trip, he said, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So Lord, give me the wisdom as to how to approach this. But at the very least, at the very least, I could pray for that family member. I could bring that family member up to the Lord. Do you know that God has done some healing in my family in in, in recent years? People that I didn't even know were, that I prayed for, who have given their lives to Jesus. They have, I have family members who have left a life of addiction and are serving Jesus today. I'm telling you, you might have to pray for a while, but you pray and don't you stop praying. Can you say amen to that? The third group, or actually this is an individual, but maybe you fit into this category. He then dealt with a doubting dad. A doubting dad. Well, pastor, what do you mean by that? I got tight. I'm blown away by how Jesus handled this situation. And I want to show you why. Look at the scripture, verse 21. It says this. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? Let's, time out. Remember what I said a few weeks ago? Every time Jesus asked a question, he already knew the answer. So, he would ask a question, and so there would be a lot of meaning to the answer 
that the person would give. So Jesus isn't taking notes and trying to find information. You got me? So he goes to the father and says, tell me, how long has he been like this? And the father says, well, since childhood. It's often throwing him into the fire and the water to kill him, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Do, <laughs> do, you, do you see the progression? Dad comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, help him. Help my boy. Help my situation. And the, and, and the, and the kid is convulsing on the ground. Okay? He, he's doing what demon-possessed people do. And, and my ministry training would be, woo, all right, we got to get all Jesus on that guy here. We're going to just pray that out of him. Huh? And, and, and Jesus didn't. Literally had him lay there. How long has he been like this, Dad? Dad said, well, since childhood. But if you can, maybe you can help us. Oh, did you, sorry, Sue, I'm running everywhere. And uh, I have jumped out of shot so many times on the live stream. So I'm so sorry, Keith, I'm so sorry, buddy. Uh, so the, oh, I hope you're catching this. The dad goes from help my boy to help us. But he doesn't stop. Verse 23, Jesus says, If you can, said Jesus, everything is impossible for the one who believes. And immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me. The kid is convulsing on the ground. And before Jesus deals with the situation that the dad brought to him, he dealt with the dad's heart first. Did you catch that? Let me try it this angle. <laughs> My good side. Uh, Jesus, before he dealt with the dad's problem, he dealt with the man's heart. See, that's precisely what Jesus will do. He wants to change our hearts before he changes our circumstances. I don't want him to do that. <laughs> In the name of Jesus, too bad. <laughs> See, because Jesus is way more concerned about your character than he is about your comfort. Well, why won't Jesus give me this? And why won't Jesus give me that? Then we're, then, we're, then, we're, then we're just spewing out all kinds of stuff that we shouldn't be spewing and our attitude stinks and we treat other people terribly around us. And, and Jesus might say, well, you know what? Before I meet your financial need or before I intervene on your behalf, can I change your heart first? Because I don't want to change your circumstance without changing your heart. Oh, Jesus doesn't want to change my circumstance without changing my heart. Why? That's mean. No, that's love. That's how much he loves me. Jesus will never just put a band-aid on a situation. So before he dealt with the boy, he dealt with the dad's heart. Whew. In the dad's case, he didn't believe. He had a lack of faith. And, and Jesus said, before I take care of your boy, I got to take care of you. And, and, and maybe for you. Now, on the flip side, I'm not suggesting that because you're still praying for something, there must be something wrong with you. Okay, don't misunderstand me. Do not misunderstand me. That's bad theology. But at the same time, at the same time, I think 
we often want Jesus to do something for us and never allow Jesus to do something in us. Should I say that again? Too often we want Jesus to do something for us without allowing him to do something in us. What does he want to do in you before he does anything for you? Because Jesus is most concerned with what's in here. So if you're in that situation, let me give you a doubting dad prayer today. It says this, Lord, help me with my unbelief. Touch my heart more than my circumstances. Touch my heart more than my circumstances. Isn't God's word powerful? That's, that's so good. I'm going to hurry. Number four, there was a, a struggling son. A struggling son. I want to talk to those of you who think you're damaged goods. I want to talk to those of you who've been through it. And Jesus has done a work in you, but you don't think there's much left that he can do. Verses 25 through 27, we read this. Look at it. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And the spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead. (laughs) But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet. And he stood up. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. Some of you, because of the mistakes that you've made, some of you, because of your history, some of you, because of what's taken place in your life, you think that, or or in fact, you have listened too much to the people who have given you up for dead. You have listened too much to the people who think that there is no longer any life left in you. And guess what? That is the moment that the Son of God will reach down and pick you up and help you to stand. If you think you have nothing to offer, Jesus offers his hand. And he says, stand up. Stand up. I got a plan for you. Everybody thinks you've been left for dead. Everybody thinks you have no life. Everybody thinks you've made too many mistakes. Everybody thinks that you are not good for anything. But Jesus says, come here, stand up. I'm going to help you stand. You're not only going to stand, you're going to have a testimony. You're not only going to have a testimony, but you're going to touch people with your testimony about what, he, what God has done in your life. If you think that there's no life left in you, Jesus offers his hand today and he says, stand up. Stand up. Quit laying there. Quit believing what, mm, quit believing what other people are saying. Quit believing what some parent told you. Quit believing what some coach or some teacher told you. Quit believing what some pastor or evangelist unfortunately told you. And stand on what the word of God has to say. And Jesus offers his hand to you. And he says, you have a future. You have a hope. You have a future. That's what I have for you. Stand. Stand up. I got a plan for your life. So if you find yourself... Like the struggling son, post demon, <laughs> that maybe you need to pray this struggling son prayer. Here's what it is Lord, even if others have given up on me, help me to stand strong for you. Mm. I firmly believe that somebody needs to pray that prayer today. Here's the last group of people. And it was a, what I call a prayerless people. <laughs> so, Jesus comes down from the mountain. There's this argument going on. A lot of his disciples are involved in this argument. And the dad steps up and says, You know what? I, I, I brought my son to you, I, to your partners here. They couldn't cast the demon out. Then Jesus takes over and after a while, 
they're in private and they have this conversation. Look at verse 28 and 29. After Jesus has gone indoors, his disciple had asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this, this kind of only comes out by, by prayer. And again, in some translations, it also adds prayer and fasting. You know what's interesting? The, if you look at Luke 10, the disciples had cast out demons before. They'd done it before. It wasn't like they were rookies, exorcism rookies. It, 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 they, they had been sent, and, and they did it. In fact, they even came back to Jesus and said, even the demons submit to us in your name, Jesus. And, and then Jesus said, you know, guys, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So don't rejoice because the demons are subject to your name. You just rejoice that your name's in the Lamb's book of life. In other words, Jesus was saying, don't, don't get the big head here. <laughs> it's not about how great you are. It's about how great God is. You just rejoice that you're saved. Yeah. So after that moment, they go to Jesus and say, okay, we cast out devils before. Why couldn't we do it again? And Jesus said, uh, guys, you only do that through prayer. You don't do that through reciting some some." mantra. You don't do that by copying what you've done in the oh. You don't do that by copying what you've done in the past. You don't do that by by trying to imitate your favorite evangelist. These things come out by prayer, by fasting. Folks, if we are serious about God, then we need to be serious about prayer. I'll say that again. If we're going to get, if we say that we're serious about God, then we have to be serious about prayer because the biggest lie of the enemy is to convince the people of God that they can do spiritual things without prayer. God help us. If we get good enough at doing spiritual things, that we do so on our own power and not on Jesus' power. God help us. So maybe, Christian, I'm talking to you today. Maybe the extent of your prayer life is now I lay me down to sleep and God bless this food, amen. Can I encourage you to step it up and pray? I mean, seek his face. Not just his hand, what he can offer you, but seek his face. Seek his face. So maybe this is your prayer. Lord, I need you. Today I choose to become dedicated in my prayer life. Great things take place when God's people pray. There are people in here. You can't physically do a lot because of limitations. But there is nothing stopping you from praying. Do you know how much it blesses me, some of you, when, all of you, any of you, when you tell me that you're praying for me? Do you know, what that, you know what that does for a pastor? Together, when we pray, we can see serious, supernatural breakthroughs take place. But these things only take place when we get serious about this. Ralph, if you can help me, I, I want to give you an opportunity. Because Jesus is coming down from the mountain, and he has paused at your heart. And, and Daniel, in the next slideshow, there, thank you, next presentation, I, I'm going to scroll all five of these prayers. That's what I'm going to do just so that you can see them again. And I wonder, do you need to pray one of these prayers again? Lord, I need, I need to have unity and not be so argumentative, not so divisive. Lord, 
Touch my heart before you touch my circumstances. Lord, when everybody else has given up on me, God, help me to stand. Lord, make me serious about my prayer life. Are you hearing me today, church? What, what's God saying to you? He's coming down from the mountain. And he finds you right where you're at. And you may not be perfect. In fact, let me just break it to you. You are not perfect. We're flawed. We've made mistakes. But the Lord wants to meet with us just like he did these groups of people. Will you let him? Will you let him speak to you today? Let's bow our heads. Can we do that? We're going to do things a little different today. First of all, I want to ask if there is somebody here, you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Or maybe you once did, but today you're not serving him. I can tell you, the heartbeat of Jesus is this. He died on the cross for you and loves you so much, so much. It doesn't matter what you've done. He loves you so much. And his forgiveness is available to you. And today, you can walk out of this building in a right relationship with Jesus. Today, you can do that. And I wonder today, and I promise I will not embarrass you, I will not embarrass you, but I do want to know whom to pray for. We had several that made this decision last week. I want to ask this question again this week. If you're not right with God and you want to get right with God today, I want to pray for you. So I'm not going to call you up, but I want to pray for you. So if that's you, could you just simply express that with an upraised hand? I want to pray for you. Pastor, I'm not right with God. I need to get right with him before I leave this place. Real quick, anyone at all? Thank you. Are there others? Amen. Christian, do you find yourself needing to pray one, two, three, four, or maybe all five of these prayers today? I want to give you a chance to do so. So I want you to make a personal altar with the Lord. Maybe it would help you to get up from your seat and come to this front area and kneel and just talk to the Lord. Maybe you're more comfortable kneeling at your chair or sitting at your chair and just talking to the Lord. But please, will you talk to Jesus today and pray that prayer that God has put on your heart? I'm going to pray. When I say amen, I want you to feel free to seek the Lord today. And don't leave. Don't leave until your conversation with Jesus is over today. And to be sensitive to everybody, could we, we'll fellowship in the lobby and not in the sanctuary today, okay? But let's, let's seek him at the foot of the mountain. Lord, I ask you that today you would meet with your people. And Jesus, whatever prayer we need to pray to you, whatever situation we're in, Wherever we are in our journey with you, God, I pray that you would not only meet with us, but speak to us. And God, also, please give us ears to listen. Give us ears to listen. So if you're touching us or our families or our situations, whatever the case might be, Lord, I pray that today would be a mile marker in our journey with you, where we could say it was on that day that things changed. So Lord, have your way in every heart and in every life. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need to pray, do so right now. Let's seek him together. When God's released you, you can consider yourself dismissed.